The worst thing that can happen to someone who's making anything in the world is apathy. You put something out and nobody cares. The second worst scenario is you put something out and everybody is very happy with it. Because that means there's nothing else left to do. When these are your most dedicated user, they have a thousand things to complain about. In AI especially, if you can do X, people now want to do Y. Unlike traditional products, where you know, okay, this has feature A, B, and C, and this is how feature A interacts with feature B. Like, you know the whole state. With large models, people can do anything in it. People can generate anime, people can generate videos of a tomato rolling down a hill. With large models, you don't know what your users are gonna do, and there's no physical scenario in which you could test all the capabilities of the model. So you really have to see what people are doing with it, where it's succeeding, where it's failing. Hey, my name is Amit. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Luma AI. At Luma, we are building multimodal general intelligence, and that starts with building world's best video models. We have so far raised $200 million from Andreessen Horowitz, Amplify Partners, Matrix Partners, NVIDIA, AMD, as well as Amazon. Luma is training models that are able to learn and generate video, audio, text, all together. Our premise is that by building models that train like human brain, we will be able to not only generate worlds, but actually solve the limitations of LLMs. I grew up in India. As a child growing up, I was mostly very deeply interested in, in physics from, from very early on, actually. I spent the majority of my time, honestly, uh, you know, learning about advanced physics and trying to you know, understand how the world works, honestly. I studied math and physics in college. I was about to go for a graduate school PhD in, in physics. Around the same time, I also started like building iOS apps. My first one was actually uh, uh, this one for solving differential equations. It got actually relatively popular uh, in the App Store. That was very interesting. Like, you know, once you make something that other people find useful, doesn't matter a large number or a small number, that really kind of changes you. Then a couple of my friends uh, started a company. I left to join them instead. And as time has gone on, a few of my friends, uh, their company was acquired by Apple. At Apple, I started working on this agent system called Shortcuts or Workflows. When we shipped that, I learned that there was this part of the world where in Apple where this new thing was being built. Some of my friends had gone there already and they got completely silent about what they were doing. It was this insane secret. Like, if you don't want me to know anything, don't tell me it's a secret. I really wanted to figure out what the hell was going on. And turns out, they were building this new thing called the Vision Pro. So I joined the team that was working on this really ambitious project for 3D capturing the world with Vision Pro. The idea was, if you're wearing this thing, we can take you anywhere because we have full control over what your eyes see. This was really close to my heart because like, you know, anything that has to do anything with simulating reality, that really draws me very close. I started to work on that project and I worked on that for about three years. This was around also the time when huge things were happening in language model land. In 2020, it like really hit me in the head because uh, the two things came out. It was the DALI paper uh, from OpenAI and this paper for 3D instruction called NERF, Neural Radiance Fields. And honestly, like that was really interesting to me because all the things we were doing procedurally by writing like, you know, a handwritten code and for rendering and for, for capturing and reconstruction, if these two things work, you can learn to represent the world. You don't, you don't need to do any rendering. You don't need to like write any graphics algorithms. And what Dali proved was that from nothing, you can generate images. You know, th that was a huge thing for me. Nerf gave you like static 3D worlds and Dali gave you images. But our world is extremely dynamic. There's like a lot of stuff happening, right? Like, you know, we, we walk around, cars move around, clouds move, all these kind of things. The question was, how can we actually simulate that world? So I started experimenting with these things. All I did was really like, you know, experiment with these methods, write all kinds of networks, train them. In about like, you know, three months time, I was extremely convinced that this is how most videos, images, things humans see will be made. And at my work, I was doing all these traditional techniques, right? So my choices were stay at Apple, right? Try to convince this big giant organization that like, hey, this is the future and, and that we should do this. And then like, you know, I need, $100 million to actually do this. Or go find 15, 20 of the most brilliant people on the planet who can actually do this for us. I tried this at Apple first. Like, yeah, this is not going to happen here. Uh, I left and, and we started Luma in 2022.
In 2023, we built a 3D generative model actually called Genie. At that time, large scale infrastructure for training and coders and things like that didn't exist. So we had to build and invent all these pieces basically. So we started that work. We built a lot, lot of large scale data collection systems, large scale training systems, all those kind of things. It took us about a year, year and a half actually. We started the work on the first video model that Luma had released in 2024 called Dream Machine. At that time, our chief scientist Jaming had joined our team, right? Like, you know, so Jaming was uh, leading image and video generation at NVIDIA. At the time, these new graphics cards were coming about or these new training chips were coming about from NVIDIA H100s. When we looked at that for the first time, we were like, okay, the cards are capable enough. The chips are capable enough. I think we can get gather enough data and the algorithms are there from our previous work on 3D generative models and things like that, that we can actually do this. So we started that process and it took us like, you know, about five or six months, actually about four and a half months, to be honest with you, to go from this first place where we had some of the infrastructure and things like that to training a proper model that we could actually release to the world. But it came after a year, year and a half of work on encoders, of learning models, of building infrastructure, all those kinds of things. All. It was also at the heels of OpenAI's Sora. So OpenAI had announced Sora in February. And that was actually really interesting because, you know, before Sora, our video efforts were a little bit smaller because we were a very small company at the time. We were barely, uh, we were barely like 20 people. We had good amount of compute, but we didn't have anywhere OpenAI level of compute. So we could not have scaled it without knowing that, oh, scaling could work. Once that evidence was in front of us, like we just scaled our efforts significantly at that point. Three months later, we had uh, the first Dream Machine model, which was uh, really funny. It was like very first early model. Today, you won't consider that to be very good, right? But at that time, that was huge and got so popular. It was on Good Morning America, it was on CNN, and then people were absolutely astonished and mesmerized by it, like, oh, you can generate video. So that made Luma into a very well-known household name at that time, and then now, and gave us, you know, all the resources we need to continue our research, to continue our work. So yeah, that was the first Dream Machine. Whenever you're developing a new capability into the world, when you're developing a new technology, oh man, it never worked the first try. It never worked the 10th try. I would really say, if you have found a good market and you want to find what fits into that market, iterate like hell. Anything that slows down your iteration velocity, avoid. If you're an engineering mindset like myself, you want to like, you know, build a very stable system, right? An extensible system with like, you know, all, all good technologies and all these kind of things. But sometimes those systems really slow you down because you, you build this monolith and it's good. It's very scalable. It's all the things, right? But the problem is to change one thing, you need to now change like, you know, five modules. Compared to that, just a bare bones thing you built in Python and like, you know, you just put it up there. You have no allegiance to it. It's already shit. So you don't care, you just iterate, you change it all day, all night, right? Like, you know, and I think that's really, really important. This episode is sponsored by Atio, the AI native CRM for the next era of companies. Connect your email and Atio instantly builds your CRM right before your eye. With every company, contact and interaction you've ever had enriched and organized. That's Atio. And here's what makes it even more game changing. You can build AI-powered automations and use its research agents to tackle some of your most complex business processes, freeing you to focus on what matters most, building your company. Join thousands of companies who are already using Atio to power their businesses. Visit the link in the description to begin your two-week free trial with Atio. The Dream Machine, created by tech company Luma, featuring a new tool that lets users turn images into video. Honestly, we thought not many people will try it because, you know, it's a really new thing. We know eventually the demand will be huge, but initially we thought like, you know, not many people would try it. But man, the number of people that tried it was insane. So we put some pricing on it. It was only because I was like, okay, well, let's see, you know, how much are people are willing to pay for it? So I had this extremely unscientific way. Let's make it really expensive. I like, you know, we'll give a small number of videos for free and then it will be 30 bucks and then 100 bucks and then 500 bucks. And the reason was solely to discover customer bases, discover who is willing to pay for it. Because if someone is willing to pay $30, they are getting something out of it. If someone is willing to pay $100, they're clearly making money from it. And if someone is willing to pay 500 bucks, right, I need to go talk to them. 
because I need to understand, well, why are you paying so much per month to, to use this product? So we took the approach of putting something out there in very unpolished state. If someone found it valuable, we would know a lot. We would learn a lot, and we did. Uh, so this was one of the people who were paying like 100 or 500 bucks. I was curious, what are they doing with this thing? I, I got on the call, and, and like, you know, this person was um, very happy, grinning like, you know, uh, ear to ear at the time. And they were like, oh, I'm very, really great to meet you. And I was like, is that you? <laughs> They're well known, especially if you know like the art directors and, and like, you know, people in the world who make movies. What I learned was that they were trying to create this scene in one of the more famous movies, right? They weren't able to do that with their traditional techniques. They tried Dream Machine and they got a really great scene out in like 30 minutes. And now this person was talking to me because they were asking me to release the rights so that they could use it in the movie. And I was just blown away. First version of the model, like it was not good enough to be used in movies generally, like it, it, really it wasn't. But here was someone who actually found even that useful. Early days, put it out, talk to users, see what they're doing, what they're not doing. Talk to them like, hey, how are you using our stuff? If you're not using our stuff, why are you not using our stuff, right? Do you know about our stuff? How did you find out? How did you not find out? We have a group of about like, you know, 2,000, 3,000 of our most engaged users in Discord. Myself, but also our research team, our product team, our engineers, they're all in that chat all day. When these are your most dedicated users, right? Like, you know, paying users, people who are like, you know, spending a lot of time on your platform, they have a thousand things to complain about. And that's very good. The worst thing that can happen to someone who's making anything in the world is apathy. You put something out and nobody cares. That's the worst scenario. The second worst scenario is you put something out and everybody is very happy with it. Because that means there's nothing else left to do. Generally, if everybody's just really telling you all good things about it, that probably means they just wanna interview you or, or they're lying to you. Unlike traditional products, where you know, okay, this has feature A, B, and C, and this is how feature A interacts with feature B, like you know the whole state very well. With large models, people can do anything with it. People can generate anime, people can generate videos of a tomato rolling down a hill. With large models, you don't know what your users are going to do. And there's no physical scenario in which you could test all the capabilities of the model. So you really have to see what people are doing with it, where it's succeeding, where it's failing. We are not a video model company. We are not building video models or image models. We, our goal is very simply to solve multimodal general intelligence. What does that mean? Our belief is that people don't want image generation models or video generation models. What people want are world builders. Every video, every movie is a world, a universe that like, you know, someone created. Whether you're talking about high fantasy like Lord of the Rings, for instance, that's a whole universe with different laws of physics, with like, you know, different characters, their, their personalities, all these things. Or if you think about a YouTube video or TikTok, they, they create a personality, a persona, all these kind of things. We need models that let people create worlds and then hit play. For that, you need to build a very different kind of intelligence. To build that kind of intelligence, text alone is just not enough. Think about the way humans learn a concept. We see it with our eyes in video, we hear about it with our ears, and we reason about it logically in text. Everything humans learn from day in and day out doesn't just happen in text, it happens in all these modalities. So if you want to build intelligence, that can collaborate with humans, digitally and physically, that can understand us, that can entertain us. You need to build intelligence that is trained on all the data a human brain is trained on, right? So video is a big part of that. So we believe that multimodal intelligence or multimodal data actually is on the critical path to AGI. When you're working on a problem that is worth solving, that really motivates you. I find anything interesting, but finding something interesting and finding something you are just so mad about, like, you know, that you want to do it, right? It's very different. Passion could be a moment in time and it can come and go. Oh, this problem, it would be so great if you could do that and you can imagine that, oh, I'm going to spend all my life doing it. Generally, that's not the case. My suggestion would be really try a lot of things and try to go deep into them. And what you want to find is not that you were interested in the depth of the problem, but whether that depth gets you more excited or less excited. When you go deep into it, you have to put effort. Sometimes when you're putting effort into it, like, oh, this is as boring as it gets, right? Don't do that. If 
you found something, then, then it gets harder. You get more excited about that, right? That's a unique thing, honestly. I can guarantee you that most people around you will just quit. Try a lot of things, try to go deep into them and try to see, can you stay excited? Not artificially, even after you're, you're done thinking about that problem, right? Like, you know, but you can't stop thinking about that problem. Like it comes to you at night. It comes to you like, oh, but how do I do that? Right, like, you know, that kind of thing. If you can find that and somehow magically or, or luckily that happens to also be an opportunity in which a company can be built, that's it.